Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy. And forgive me for the fact that my videos are getting a little bit fewer and further between. It's a little bit like that at the moment. To be honest, right, um, the longer I stay away from the Western world, you know, the longer I stay away from England, the place where I started doing my videos back in the days of the lurky lockdown, right, um, the more I kind of feel detached from it all the more I kind of feel that as we go into the future um, and uh, that part of the world, the West, as I like to call it, the sinking ship countries, right, just become a distant memory. And um, for me, places that I do not desire to go to or return to in any form whatsoever, right? Um, I'm from now wondering whether even my channel is relevant anymore. I hope it is, and I hope people still will enjoy my perspectives nevertheless. But I do feel a little bit like that that I am less relevant, you know. And luckily enough, I'm not like a celebrity tart who has to prostitute himself in order to stay relevant. That's just not the sort of person that I am. So if I become less relevant, then what the hell, I don't mind. I can only hope though, as I talk about what I talk about, that enough people will um, uh, appreciate what I have to say. But we'll see how it goes. Uh, today, I really don't know what to talk about. I mean, the, the idea I've got in my mind uh, as, a, as a working title to for this video is um, countries that are sinking ships versus countries that are lifeboats. And I thought, well, that's a good place to start. And well, I just look at the Western world and I just see it as a sinking ship or a bunch of sinking ships, like the Titanic going down, or a, you know, a, a thrashing dying beast, probably be a better way of putting it. And um, that's all I see. So there seems to be that what they want to do is take freedoms away, add more controls and uh, make our lives more of a misery, impoverish us and just whatever. That's all they seem to want to do. And um, it's like, yeah, the freedom that was once there, that was once taken for granted, has been slowly eroded away, slowly to begin with and then suddenly. That's what it seems like to me. So slowly to begin with and then suddenly seems to be the trajectory of all of this right now. And um, so what I would like to do though is see the divisions that exist, at least in the society that I come from, how they've evolved over time. And uh, if there were any telltale signs or any red flags going far enough back, I don't know really, because it's very hard to pinpoint how it happened, when it happened and what's going on now. So I'll go back to, um, let me see, the, the immediate post-war era, if you like, with the old Britain, how it used to be back in the old days. There was a man who sold newspapers who had a Cockney accent, and he had a son, and his son's name was George Martin, grew up in a working class environment. But this George Martin uh, decided to get elocution lessons to, so that he could speak posh. Now he had these kind of chiselled features, so that kind of, um, he looked the part. So he learnt how to speak posh. He, he actually got officer training in the army um, around about the war time. And then he ended up um, working for the BBC at a time when the Goon Show were playing. So he got into things like comedy sound effects and stuff like that. He ended up being the head of Parlophone Records, a subsidiary of EMI, and ended up being one of the people that we think of as the fifth Beatle. He was their producer, wasn't he? So he was a producer of the Beatles. And so people automatically think that, um, that George Martin was posh, but he wasn't. He was from a working class background and he just learnt to speak posh. And as a result, he managed to move himself up. So in a way, it didn't work for everyone. One person it did work for, I suppose, was uh, Roger Moore. Roger Moore, just like Michael Caine, was from South London, where like Michael Caine had more the accent of someone who came from there. Oi, who you so near you? Right, so, Whereas Roger Moore spoke much posher and more uh, debonair. The name's Bond, James Bond. You can't imagine Michael Caine. My name is James Bond. Not a lot of people know that, because I'm a spy. Hey, <laughs> but it still worked though, wouldn't it? But they were both from South London. I mean, you know, they were both sort of like in a working and lower middle class varieties. Um, I think Roger Moore's dad was a policeman and he just lived in a normal house, probably a terraced or a semi-detached house in uh, Stockwell, South London. But because um, for whatever reason he managed to cultivate this posh voice and he had these chiselled features, he got to be an officer as well. So there are people who had managed to play the system to get themselves up in um, society, so to speak. And that was the way you did it in the old days. 
you could just learn to speak posher. Like, I mean, I, I didn't actually try to speak posher myself. I don't know how I ended up with the accent I do. And when, I, when, I'm in, uh, when I'm in West Drayton, Middlesex, with the old working class West Drayton, they say, right, oh, what game's that? Right. When I'm there, they think I speak posh. But if I go to somewhere uh, bourgeois and bohemian, like, uh, like Barnes or Richmond, or, you know, one of those places, or modern day lefty Islington, they probably think I'm an oik because I don't sound as posh as the rest of them. They're all trying to outplumb each other with their accents, you see. So that this class division that still exists in England is absolutely ridiculous. It's the right fucking clown show. But it's been like that for a long time. It does seem to be exclusive to England and it doesn't really exist in a lot of other countries. But what's changed recently, and especially as the world has become more homogenous and globalised with the internet and especially with the advent of woke, one of the things that has changed, if you like, um, in the UK is that since the old days, um, you can't just have luxury items, all right, you could have a Rolex and a Lambo or something like that, but you'd have to be extremely well off um, to have that. But if you're an um, aspiring middle class person, no one can afford really a Rolex or a Lambo or whatever, not unless they're, you know, into being millionaires or something like that, uh, getting to be very rich. So, um, uh, and also the fact is that like a lot of working class done good people, a few of them have slipped through the net, gone up and ended up with Rolexes. So the thing is they can't really use materialism anymore um, to say that they're better than everyone else. And especially um, in the age that we're in at the moment with uh, you know, the fact that uh, other countries like America, which dominates the world culturally, has got lots of um, hip hop artists with all the bling in the universe. And well, they don't really look like they've left the hood. They just look like they've they're in the hood and they've won the lottery. They don't really look like so. So as a result, um, luxury items, so to speak, within the English class system don't really count. And in this age of woke now, the only thing that they've got left is luxury beliefs. So um, unlike back in the old days, I wouldn't have to speak posh. I wouldn't have to put on that accent. I mean, all right, I could speak the way I do um, and I'd be able to pass because I don't sound too common. I don't sound as common as much. But in London, I could have these slight estuary tones in my accent, but I could speak well. And then all I have to do is go on about how, um, you know, how great the European Union is and um, how I support Ukraine and um, Palestine and, uh, and have rainbow flags everywhere and declare that trans women are women and all of that, all the usual woke stuff while hanging around with the Islington set. And that would be all I would need to, um, get invited to those dinner parties, you see, because those luxury beliefs now um, replace the luxury items of old. So the only thing that they've got to, just, you know, that they're these days in order for you to be part of um, an elite or to get into an elite is for you to be pro all of the things that are basically eroding out and destroying our culture, our freedom, our sovereignty and our sense of who we are. But if it doesn't matter whether you're posh anymore, right? Um, if you don't support these luxury beliefs these days, um, you'll be outcasted, you'll be cancelled, and um, that's just that's the end of it, you know? Especially if you are highly influential. So, the West seems to be falling to pieces now because the trouble is that what's going on at the moment is, uh, it looks to me like freedom of speech has been eroded. Um, if, if anyone, sees that something is a cause for concern and wants to speak about it, they're not allowed to because everyone's far right now, unless of course they go along with what the BBC and The Guardian want everyone to go along with. Um, if you've read 1984, as I've done a few times, even listened to the audiobook version and watched the movie version to try to get a good understanding of the manual, so to speak, of how to take your freedoms away because that's what it's being used for these days. Double think, double speak, new speak, all of those concepts in there. <clears throat> How to create a world that is the opposite to the words that you were using, which is pretty much what it is. Um, you know, peace means war and, um, you know, freedom means slavery, all of this sort of stuff, uh, which is basically what's been done. Um, then you know what to look out for when the world changes around you. And this is one of the things that I have um, noticed. But I've also noticed that we've been predictively programmed over the course of the last 30 years to think that when we lose our freedoms, it will come from the far right. And the people who seem to be taking our freedoms away from us now seem to be coming from the far left 
and accusing everyone who are worried about our freedoms from disappearing of being far right. So we've got to the point now where if you complain that your freedom of speech is being eroded, you're far right. If you're complaining that the diversity doesn't include diversity of opinion and belief, then you're far right. You know, you see, that's kind of like how it goes at the moment. So, um, you know, uh, so as a result, I just decided that I don't want to be there anymore. I can't stand it. I can't stand all this political gaslighting. It's all a load of bollocks. I don't want time for it. Fuck it. It's just to hell with it. And then I find myself where I am now, Philippines, after spending some time in Costa Rica as well. And one of the things that I kind of notice about here, I don't know if I've mentioned this before in another video or not, but the wife, Angela, when we were in Costa Rica, she was reading about um, something that was supposed to be happening here in the Philippines. And she was talking about how, you know, the international community wanting to send, I don't know if it's 1,100 or 11,000 Afghans to the Philippines. And she wasn't happy with it. She didn't want that to happen. And then in the end, President Marcos decided that he was going to reject this idea and as a result none of these Afghans came here and um, you know because of course uh, this is the Philippines and she's brown and everyone here is majority brown um, it's not very easy for you to accuse them of being white supremacists or racists or bigots for wanting to keep their uh, country or their culture somewhat homogenous now, of course, they've got no problem with, um, you know, they've got no problem with Western expats because Western expats come over and marry the women. So even if we do uh, get, even if we do float above the culture and are somewhat semi-detached, we're still integrated a little bit, you see. So that's uh, kind of um, how it goes in that way. But it's quite understandable when I actually think of it from the perspective of someone who is not British, not Western and not white, you know, not wanting um, for their country to be invaded in that kind of way that Europe has become invaded with. Um, and that's a, an issue. You see, back in the old days, we did, once upon a time, have these people like, uh, or, or in the UK, people like Oswald and Mosley, who had um, a group called the British Union of Fascists. Um, he never really was taken that seriously. Politically, he didn't have a chance in hell of being able to take over. We had, um, in more recent years, Nick Griffin of the BNP, who, again, you know, not a chance in hell of them becoming a, a political storm that would take over the whole of the UK. There was no danger of that. We knew that the people who were far right, I, as far as I can remember, all throughout my life, growing up in the UK, that there were a lot of nutters, there were a lot of crazies, but it was never anything to worry about. You didn't have to worry that you'd wake up the next day and that you would have a far-right government. But they were always making it seem like once the, uh, once the freedom goes away and once tyranny kicks in, it would come from the far right. And the one movie, of course, that comes to mind um, is V for Vendetta. This was, um, V for Vendetta was a dystopian future in the UK. I mean, it's a good movie and I still like it. But the thing is, right, that uh, most of the actors involved in it um, and the directors and the production company, all these people who were involved in the making of it, have all gone woke now. And they, to me, all seem like they're part of the new far-left authoritarianism, even though they were playing freedom fighters in this. Well, pretty much exactly what happened in um, V for Vendetta is beginning to happen um, in the Western world anyway. The, the loss of freedoms, the loss of freedom of speech, um, the cancellation and removal of people for your protection, but it appears, it appears to be coming from the other side. And the thing about it is that because um, we've been spending all this time in a world where the loss of our freedoms, we were told, would be coming from the far right and not from anywhere else. Um, and of course, because in our history, World War II and all of that, the only enemies that, added, that acted as an existential threat to our culture seemed to come from the far right, like Hitler, etc. Um, unlike on the other side of the Iron Curtain, the Eastern Bloc countries where the existential threat came from communism and so as a result um, it, uh, they were exposed to the, the things that Stalin and Mao would have done. So Eastern Europe does not take this on board quite as easily and doesn't buy into it quite as easily as Western Europe does, um, you might have noticed. So 
then what happened is that the people who were supposed to be, the people who would be our counterculture, the people who would um, protect our freedom, the people who used to be anti-war when we knew that the wars were being manufactured, back in, you know, especially the Iraq War, Tony Blair era, Bush era, well, they've turned into the establishment class themselves. A flippening of thought happened. A lot of people didn't see this flippening happen. And that's the, the mess that we're in at the moment. So as a result of it, there are a lot of people who are blind to how our freedoms have gone. They, the, some, and a lot of people, because we're living in this balkanized world now with the internet and social media, and everyone's living in this fragmented world, everyone's not only living in a world of different opinions, but they're all living in a world of different facts now. And this balkanization of epistemologies, as Terence McKenna would call it, have been turned up to 11. So there are people out there that still think that the far right are that much of a threat. And of course, these people who think that the far right are a threat are taking away and eroding away at freedom of speech, are becoming more authoritarian, and they honestly think that they are pro-freedom. And uh, but be, they'd be the first to cancel if you don't conform to the way you should be. You've got to think like this, you've got to use this terminology, you've got to be like this, and um, if, you, if you agree with anyone from J.K. Rowling or uh, Elon Musk these days or whatever, you know, you're a pariah, you're a, you're a Nazi, you're a fascist. <laughs> but they seem to be behaving more like that. And um, this is the thing. When it comes to um, left and right, I mean, I kind of think of these things as the illusions. I think it's a misplaced model. You see, I just think of like um, only in terms of authoritarians and, in, and libertarians, or in terms of individualist and collectivist. You see, the the way it works with um, individualism is that, like, you know, I have my rights, but my rights stop at your rights, and your rights stop at my rights. So that's how it goes. I have the right to do anything I want to do, as long as it stops at someone else's right to do anything and everything that they want to do. And as a result, that's how we reach consensus. Um, I don't think that I need to have rights based on my gender, my background, my, um, you know, my, my ancestry, the colour of my skin, or any of these things. I don't think any of that matters. I think that I just need to be sovereign, sovereign as an individual, consider my rights to be God-given, and just act out what I need to do. But my right to infringe other people's rights, well, that's where it stops. And it's very simple to understand. And if everyone was to think like that, in that way, then of course um, we would have a good working uh, model of political individualism, which would be good, that with libertarianism as well. And again, you know, governments, well, they can't be trusted, and Westerners now know this more than any other people at the present time that we're existing at the moment. Um, you know, because they're run by humans, and humans can be tempted, and temptation brought to humans can bring corruption and power can come to human beings and bring corruption. And, um, you know, that's the trouble, and no culture is really uh, immune from that. And we thought we were in the West. We thought, oh, we're the freest, we're the best, we're the most enlightened, we're the most advanced, but no, it didn't take long. And then, you know, we thought that of Germany. Germany had the, was an emerging economy, had the best intellects, had the best um, philosophers. It was an extremely sophisticated country, really good education. And yet they turned into barbarians, didn't they? Especially during the Second World War. And you think, how the hell did that happen? Like, how the hell with Britain and Canada and America and Australia and New Zealand, how are they becoming what they're becoming at the moment? Especially in the post lurgy era, you know? And a lot of people like to say, oh, there's a secret cabal. And there probably is. Or there might be a bunch of competing cabals. But what I see is this is just... Um, when, when the most powerful who've been sitting at the top and have been taken for granted that they're sitting, sitting at the top are now falling, then they're going to be like um, a dying, thrashing beast. That's when they're going to get at their worst. And that's when you want to get out of the way of the cornered rats, so to speak. And, well, I would rather be here now. I would rather not ever have to, ever have to deal with the Western world. I'd rather just be here now. And the reason why is that because... Um, this is what's known as a tiger cub economy, an Asian tiger cub economy, you know? I found out recently that in 1997, um, the Philippines had a, an economy that was, actually, I don't know how it compared to the, to the UK. The UK's economy was, say, 15 times bigger, right? 
it's now only seven and a half times bigger. In that time, between 1997 and now, um, the Philippines economy and the UK economy were growing at the same speed up until 2008. In 2008, the British economy just started going sideways, up and down, bull and bear, but basically the same tops and bottoms. The Philippines economy literally doubled in relation to the UK economy in that time. And if you look at a lot of the countries outside the West, this is the one thing you see. They didn't get stagnant after 2008, but a lot of the Western economies, maybe, you know, also the Japanese economy to some degree as well, right? But not a lot of the poorer third world emerging economies started growing. China just go, you know, India up, you know, the Philippines up. Uh, as well as that, um, a lot of um, Latin American countries, South American countries, you know, uh, have become the tiger economies. They have not stagnated. But the West has stagnated, especially European countries. In fact, Europe is the most economically stagnant place in the world and has been now for the last 16 years. And um, at the same time that that's happening, the demographic change that's happened in that time is pretty shocking, as well as that. Um, the, uh, the loss of freedoms, the loss of freedom of speech and you know, the, the increase in bureaucracy, the increase in the size of the state and all of that, they're going in a really bad way. They have a lot of power, they have um, a lot of resources, but at the moment they seem to be using these power and resources to enslave people. <clears throat> and it doesn't look very good at the moment. And I personally say that I have lost all hope with uh, the Western world right now. It was good while it lasted, but as Agent Smith said in The Matrix, like the dinosaurs, you had your time. And that's how I, that's, that's basically what I feel right now. And, um, you know, we're told that all of these things, all these privileges that we have in the Western world are all, you know, this is all white privilege. And I think, well, just, just shut up and fuck off. Don't bring race into it. Here I am in this part of the world. They have cars. They have street lights, they have good shopping malls, and to be honest, they're, they're much more thriving than the ones back in the West right now. They really are. I was in one only the other day. I was amazed, literally every unit was open. No problem, not only that, but uh, it's the first time I've been here since before the Lurgy, and I noticed it expanded, and there's more, and it's growing. And the people look better off, you know? A lot of people look better off here now. It looks like it's going through its own 1980s at the moment, you know? compared to Europe, which looks like everything is closing down. And again, you know, like I say, the one thing uh, I do notice is that there's a wider disparity in Europe as well. I saw pictures of what Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament and Westminster Abbey looked like in 1982. They did look a bit grubby. Same with St Paul's, all black with soot. And they've all been cleaned up now, and the Palace of Westminster looks like gleaming gold. And, you know, Westminster looks really clean. But once you get away uh, from the touristy bits or the posh bits, um, everything's just falling to pieces. So in a way, this is what I see where the, uh, the state and the establishment wants to look really opulent and really posh. The poshest areas and the corporate and gentrified areas want to look really posh and they've gone out of their way to do it and they built up more skyscrapers in London and stuff. But once you get out into the really deprived areas, they are really deprived and they're more deprived than they've been in a very, very long time. So you wipe the middle class out. I know I'm always joking, I'm, always t well, I'm, saying I'm not always joking, I'm always taking a piss out of the middle class. But if you take the middle class away and you've just got the very rich and the very poor, um, your culture goes with it, everything goes with it, the freedom goes with it. Here, it's going in the other direction. There's an emerging middle class and they're getting bigger and bigger in numbers. So that's what I see. Why would I want to go back to the West? Why would I ever want to go back to the West at this point? I think it's just too late right now. And so I'm just thinking, right, do you live on a sinking ship? Why not move to a lifeboat? Because that's how I'm seeing the world at the moment. Sinking ship places, lifeboat places. And um, we'll see how it goes. But so I've got to be honest, I do not really have much hope anymore for the Western world. I think it's, uh, I think it's gone. I was more optimistic before, you know, in previous videos that I've done, I was more optimistic before than I am now. I'm not particularly very optimistic about that part of the world and um, all I wanted to do was get away from it. That's really all I wanted to do because, um, you know, it's very disappointing to see what's going on. But, you know, in a way, with the people who are staying and fighting, I am in spirit there. 
with the people who are staying and fighting, you know, because that's uh, how it is. And uh, we, shall, uh, we shall see how it goes. Sorry if uh, today's episode is a little bit lacking in uh, a focus. I think I'm not lacking in focus, but uh, it's just that these last few days, this last half a month in particular, I've not been very inspired when it comes to what I want to talk about. And, you know, I don't know, it's like that. I go in peaks and troughs when I'm making these videos. Sometimes I think, oh, I just don't know what to talk about. And uh, it's been a lot like that recently. Um, I feel like I'm drifting further and further away from having a Western-centric view on things because it's been so long since I've been there and a lot of my audience are in the West. So, yeah, that's the thing. And I can't, I, I can't pretend that uh, I can always stay relevant, you know, but uh, you can let me know in the comments what you think about that, if you so wish. And I do hope you do, because if you do smash the likes, you know, for the likes and comment, it helps the algorithm and it gets the video to be known and more and more people are likely to see it. And I'll tell you, talking about stagnation, my subscriber numbers have been stagnant for quite a long time. I've done okay to get over the thousand in the first couple of years, but in the last three years, nah, not much has happened, you know? I mean, you know, my channel should be known and I'm torn between one and another thing. Yeah, I'd like my channel to have lots of more subscribers, but likewise, also, I don't want to risk the fame because I think if you become too famous, you get in the crosshairs. So there's another part of me that likes the obscurity. Oh, what a dilemma. Anyway, I shall leave you to it. See you later, alligator. See you soon. Baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.